Hi, everyone. Um, sorry for the late start. Uh, my name is Shorov Sharkar, and I am with Labor Notes. Um, welcome to this event on labor and climate change solutions. Um, we are going to be talking with Lexi from Amazon Employees for Climate Justice, as well as David Yao um, from the APWU, um, Seattle local. Um, uh, folks are joining from, both David and Lexi are from Seattle. Um, uh, just uh, to let everyone know how we'll be proceeding, we're gonna have both of our panelists speak for about 10, 12 minutes. And then after that, um, we'll have a brief discussion and then um, we'll have Q and A. Um, there should be a Q and A function on um, your, uh, your Zoom. Um, so feel free to put questions into that Q&A and then um, you'll be able to submit your questions and then we will take them as we get them. Um, it looks like we have about 35 people with us today. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to having this conversation. Um, it comes at a really crucial time as the pandemic is showing us what the future of um, climate change might look like and um, some of the inequalities that get raised in climate change and some of the factors that are going to be uh, hopefully addressed by building worker power to remedy the problem. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Lexi. Um, and Lexi is going to be speaking about their work um, with Amazon employees for climate justice. Thanks, Shorov. Um, good to see everyone here. I'm really excited uh, to learn from you all. Um, so I'm Lexi. I'm a software engineer uh, at Amazon in Seattle. I've been organizing with Amazon employees for climate justice for about two years now. Uh, I kind of my like personal story about how I got into this work. Uh, I grew up in San Bernardino, California, which is a huge logistics hub. So I grew up around warehouses, trucking, that was really normal. Um, and so like even my first job out of high school was in a warehouse. Um, and so after college, I moved to Seattle to work at Amazon HQ. And I really saw like the disparity between my hometown uh, where Amazon is the number one employer and Seattle, uh, where I have to assume Amazon is also the number one employer, but for tech workers. Um, and just seeing like my hometown, which is a majority black and Latinx neighborhood. And like every time I go and visit my mom, it's like the pollution is worse and worse every time versus like Seattle, which is like clear air, like super wealthy. It's just like that really kind of drew you know, it really made it clear to me that like so much wealth is being extracted from my community and like brought into um, these like corporate spaces. Uh, so like something like 20,000 diesel trucks pass by my mom's house every day. And so like that was really what made me feel like, you know, working at Amazon, like what can I do to make a change that will like impact uh, my community? Uh, so part of ACJ uh, in our work, like one of our values is that uh, we believe in anti-racism. And so what that looks like for the climate crisis uh, is that we believe like environmental racism is the root cause of the climate crisis. And so we have to address these sort of inequalities in order to like build that just world. Um, and so kind of like what I wanted to show with my, you know, story was that like uh, Amazon's whole business is built on these like sacrifice zones. Uh, which are like uh, warehouses uh, built in places where it's uh, majority like people of color uh, and like ACJ's done research and we've seen that something like 80% of warehouses are located in majority people of color communities. Um, and so what we've been doing is like Amazon employees for climate justice is like Amazon is such a huge power. Uh, and so we really believe in like organizing workers and worker power to like put that in check and to like enact like transformative change. Um, so yeah, um, I think like 
kind of like a story on like why we think like we really need to address environmental racism specifically. Uh, I've had like a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> once uh, with a coworker and uh, she kind of pushed back on like uh, our like approach around like organizing. Uh, she kind of suggested to me like, if you want to like solve pollution in like your hometown and in your mom's neighborhood, like why don't you go work on like the supply chain optimization team and stuff like that. Uh, but as many of us maybe know, like when business costs go down, like business doubles. And so like, unless we address these core inequalities, like we're not going to see like the transformation we need to address the climate crisis. Um, and so just like thinking about that and like how um, the labor and climate movements are connected, like you can't separate the warehouse from the people who live in that neighborhood. These warehouses are like built, you know, basically next to houses and like diesel trucks run through these neighborhoods. Uh, and also like the people who live in these neighborhoods are also the workers who are working in this in these warehouses, right? So now workers are also like shouldering the pollution burden. Um, and so I think our group, sometimes we run up against like, there's sometimes a tension in like organizing uh, around like issue-based organizing and like wages, benefits, and like working conditions organizing. I think we definitely believe like we need all of it. Um, but for our group, what we've seen is like people's interests as workers um, is really a lot more expansive than just their workplace. People care about like their homes and their families and uh, a crisis like the climate crisis really like touches people's humanity. And like, uh, it's been really energizing to like talk to coworkers about this and really bring people into uh, like organizing and like worker power, uh, especially people who may not have like been in that space before. Um, and so like, I feel like even in our group, we've seen people really transformed by talking about issues of like racial justice and environmental justice uh, and really giving people a space to work on these things. Um, so some of like what our group has done in the past, uh, we've had a walkout in 2019. Uh, we had like 3000 people sort of worldwide, like 2000 plus uh, tech workers in Seattle specifically. And Amazon uh, responded with the climate pledge. Uh, we demanded like zero emissions by 2030 and investing in um, communities of color first. So back to like how we have to address the sacrifice zones built into Amazon's business. Uh, and so Amazon's climate pledge, it's like net zero by 2040 and doesn't really have sort of a justice lens and doesn't address racial justice at all. Uh, so we're still focusing on organizing that. Uh, and so currently what we're working on is a shareholder resolution um, around environmental racism, like asking Amazon to uh, release uh, data on like where their pollution is concentrated because we've done our own research and seen that the majority of warehouses are in communities of color, but making sure that it's like um, tracked by the business, we can like push back on that uh, a lot more. Uh, and so just thinking about like anti-racism and how we, uh, how that's core to our organizing. Uh, one of the things that we do is race-based caucusing. Uh, so we have uh, a tool um, where certain discussions will split into caucuses based on race. So we'll have a white caucus and a POC caucus, which is person of color caucus. Uh, and I think in our group, we've seen that be really transformative. Uh, I remember kind of after the walkout, there was lots of like conflict sort of in our group, uh, just like people pushing back on like, well, like, should we prioritize like reaching out to people of color? Like, how can we do that? Like, if people are wanting to get involved, it's like, you know, sort of a like race blind approach. Um, and now I think at least uh, for myself, like participating in a POC caucus and stuff, like seeing my leadership get backed, I think even in like the corporate space being from, um, somewhere like San Bernardino, which is like the sort of where the fulfillment centers are. I always felt like that was sort of a detriment, but seeing that like celebrated and really trusting the leadership has been transformative for me uh, and giving people uh, like in White Caucus a place to like work on their own anti-racism uh, has been really uh, like energizing for people. And so uh, we've seen lots of people get more involved with these like changes that we've been doing. Uh, 
And I think kind of one of our like core ideas is that like we lose a lot more people by not addressing racial justice uh, than we do by, uh, you know, avoiding the issue of racial justice. Uh, and like just knowing that our coworkers and warehouses are like majority like black and Latinx, like being able to like work with them and like show that we are uh, actually enacting anti-racism has been really powerful. Like with our resolution, we're working with frontline communities in San Bernardino uh, and like frontline organizers. Um, and so I think like that is possible because of our like commitment to anti-racism. Um, and yeah, I think that's like my, I guess my like main, main ideas is like thinking about uh, solutions to the climate crisis. Like we need to talk about racial justice, especially in uh, the United States and like, especially with Amazon. Amazon recently like released their, uh, racial breakdown of their workforce. And so you can really see that like the corporate employees are majority um, white and Asian and then warehouse employees are like majority black and Latinx. And so like even in the corporate space that is really felt. And so like we need to be working with people who are like closest to the issues to get like the right solutions. Um, and yeah, I think that's my I'll stop there. And I'd love to hear what David has to say. Thanks, Thanks. so much, Lexi. Um, and yeah, uh, folks, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A in advance. Um, I see we have one there already. Um, and uh, now we will turn to David Yao, who's the vice president of the Seattle local of APWU, um, who are postal workers in the postal service. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here and being interested in this topic. Um, I've been interested in the topic of climate change for a long time and uh, personally made a decision to um, buy a car that is a hybrid, a Chevy Volt, a 2013, um, which we run mostly on electricity and we changed our house's uh, gas furnace over to a heat pump, which runs totally on electricity and um, relies on almost no fossil fuel because we're fortunate enough to have um, almost totally renewable energy in our electricity sources here in Seattle. So anyway, I work for the Postal Service and the Postal Service um, issues every year a sustainability report. And it's a very interesting report. It's full of wonderful phrases such as um, they're mindful of our environmental footprint. Um, we consider it our responsibility to be good stewards of the environment. We set aggressive targets for energy use, water use, and greenhouse gas emissions. The whole report talks about things like recycling. They have lots of little pilot projects. But if you really crunch the numbers and dig down into the report, you'll see it's, it's uh, where it really counts in terms of addressing climate change. The amount of fuel they use for the uh, transportation of mail uh, throughout the country, the Postal Service is basically um, greenwashing their performance. And I'll give you an example. Uh, the, uh, they set a target for a 20% drop in petroleum use, and the Postal Service has 230,000 delivery and transportation vehicles that they operate. So they have a very large fleet. It's the biggest source of their carbon footprint. They set a goal for a 20% drop from 20, 2005 to 2015. Instead of decreasing their petroleum use, the petroleum use went up by 20%. Um, it went up another 10% by 2018. So in 13 years, the Postal Service went from using 144 million gallons of gasoline to using 186 million gallons of gasoline. This is you know, buried deep in the report. So basically the, the, the employer is BSing on their commitment to stopping climate change. In fact, they don't even use the words climate change in the report. However, 2021 presented a golden opportunity to, to change all this stuff because um, of the 200,000 actual delivery vehicles, a lot of them were really old. Over 400, over 400 of them had caught on fire. They were so old, they needed to be replaced. And so there is um, a major contract was gonna be awarded to replace um, as many as 160,000 of these delivery vehicles. And it came down to two finalists in companies that were bidding for the contract. One would make electric vehicles and one would make gasoline vehicles. Well, uh, President Biden came out with a, um, a 
sort of announcement that he wanted to electrify the entire federal fleet, of which the Postal Fleet is a subset. But when it came time to award the contract, the Postal Service awarded it to the a company that was going to build a gasoline power fleet, and um, maybe 10% of that would be electric. So this caused a big furor, um, and it's, it's been a big issue. Um, our union, a couple of days later, in testimony before, before Congress, um, came out in favor of electric vehicles. Our president, Mark Dimmenstein, was very progressive. Uh, we were fortunate to have him um, issue testimony basically in support of funding for the Postal Service to electrify their fleet. In fact, Congress did pass a bill, uh, well, I'm sorry, the House of Representatives passed the bill in uh, 2020 that would have provided money for the Postal Service to electrify their fleet and provided for uh, public charging stations at every public post office for use by employees and the public. Very progressive thing. And our union came out publicly in favor of that. So um, the, um, the question hasn't been settled. There are a lot of objections in Congress to, um, to this, the awarding of this contract to, you know, basically building in fossil fuel use into the postal infrastructure for, for decades to come, literally. Um, the uh, Biden administration's infrastructure bill does have money that would, would provide for the electrification of the postal fleet. And so we're really hopeful that um, that can stay in there and get passed in Congress. That's, that's a very big issue. Let me talk a little bit about, the, um, about education around climate change in my union. Um, in 2019, at a national educational conference attended by a thousand union officers and stewards and members, uh, we had our first climate change session. Um, I was asked to, to help conduct that as well as our vice president, Debbie Soretti. And in this uh, workshop, uh, we, one of the things we did was ask uh, people who attended their stories that relate, that relate to their personal experiences with the effects of climate change and extreme weather. And of course, very recently we would had uh, quite a series of fires, droughts, floods, and so forth. And we had members who were in attendance who talked about having to be evacuated because of the fires in California, people who lost their houses to fires, um, people who, who had lost their houses to floods in the South. And so I think um, listening to the members' stories about their personal experiences um, was sort of, um, helped solidify in the minds of people who were there that this was really a problem. What we also did was um, our union uh, printed up a survey based on a survey uh, that's written up by the Labor Network for Sustainability, and we passed it out to as many of the, of the, of the attendees at the conference that we could. We got several hundred responses back. It basically asked um, a number of different questions, and let me um, give you some of the responses. Um, so 62% um, of the people who responded to the survey felt that climate change events had increased in frequency and, and intensity. 76% had family members who had been affected by extreme weather recently. And 30% who responded said that they had um, personally suffered health problems that were exacerbated by extreme weather. 83% um, said they thought it was better for the union to engage in the fight against climate change, and 87% felt our employer, the Postal Service, had failed to communicate the impacts of climate change either on the Postal Service or on their work location. That it's basically a topic that our employer is ignoring. So I think the survey um, method is something that people can use to sort of raise awareness and um, the survey results were published in our national newspaper, and I think when people see that there's a, um, a big uh, consensus of opinion around this issue among their coworkers, I think it helps empower uh, them not only to do something about it, but it empowers the union leadership. And one of the things that, um, that I and other activists have done is, is try and get resolutions passed. So we passed resolutions in favor of the Green New Deal at the state and local level. The letter carriers union passed a, a, a resolution in favor of electric vehicles. And um, I think the resolution process can be educational for the people who are participating in it. Uh, it, um, it also, I think, can be used to push your union leadership to do something. Or if you have a progressive union leadership, it can empower them to 
take more action you know, because every union has its own internal politics. And you've got people who are progressive on issue and people who just don't really care. So I think these resolutions can be useful. Uh, on the other hand, resolutions can be just pieces of paper that are put in a book and filed away if you don't actually have people following up and pushing to, to take action on this. So uh, a couple of things my union has done. Um, we, there's a there's a uh, grand alliance to save our public postal service, which uh, my union was instrumental in initiating. It's about 80 different organizations that work to preserve the public postal service and um, Greenpeace and the Sierra Club, two environmental organizations, are part of that effort. So we really try to broaden our reach to get as much and many different kinds of, of uh, public organizations and, and nonprofits to support um, our efforts. Um, one of the things I think we could improve in um, is in, is in um, decreasing employee commute times because that's a climate change issue. It's also an issue of convenience um, and a benefit for individual members. So there you don't have to be, you know, just preaching on a big issue. If you talk about things that, that affect members in their own personal life, that's really important. I just had a, a member who bid from a job where I work to a, a work location uh, that would reduce their commute time by um, over an hour a day. And we do have good transfer rules in the Postal Service, but they could be better. Right now, management can turn down transfers. And I think that's one of the things where um, individual members who aren't looking at big picture, they, they can see a benefit to themselves um, if you're pushing for something that, that both reduces their commute time and, um, and also obviously uh, reduces the, the transportation, their transportation impact and their carbon emissions. So I guess, um, let's see. Well, one more thing I, I'd like to talk about um, a little speed bump we hit along the way, I should say. Um, so my union in 2016, we put forth a resolution in favor of electric vehicles in the, for the Postal Service, right? And the wording basically said that, you know, post, that electric vehicles may cost more to purchase initially, but they save the organization money in the long run because there's lower fuel costs and less maintenance. My union represents the maintenance workers who maintain these vehicles and they have their own craft and they have their own meetings and they saw that resolution. They did not like it. They did not like the fact that these vehicles would have less maintenance. And the basic problem is that um, uh, right now they're not getting the training they need to, to maintain the vehicles that they're supposed to maintain. They're, they're just, they're shorthanded. They're not getting, the management doesn't want to spend money on training. So they're thinking, wow, we're going to lose our jobs because they're not going to train us to do this stuff. So that division of our union voted, voted against that resolution and basically torpedoed it's being passed by our union. Um, and it, it kind of shows, I think, the importance of thinking through um, things like these resolutions and how they'll affect members concretely and uh, doing the education and having discussions needed before you sort of take some of these moves because this was, you know, obviously in hindsight, it was, a, it was not thinking through how uh, one section of our workforce would react to that and not addressing their needs or concerns. So, um, yeah, so anyway, I guess that I'd sort of sum up by saying, you know, what things that you could do, you can research your, your employer's carbon emissions, you can try and get your union to address these issues, you can do resolutions, and you can try to educate the members. And those are kind of just general advice I would give on this issue. And I'd certainly be happy to hear, I'm sure we all would be happy to hear from other folks' um, experiences in working on these issues in the labor movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, and thanks to both of you. I think um, you both raised some really important issues in the context of the labor fight against climate change. Um, both in terms of racial justice work, um, as well as the need to have a just transition for workers that are disproportionately affected by a transition to a uh, clean and green environment um, and workforce and employment schemes. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, um, folks who are attending can submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, so we have a couple of questions so far, and I'm going to turn to one of those now. Um, and this question is for Lexi. 
um, and it's from Felix. And the question is, love hearing about this work, Lexi, and the way you're centralizing racial justice in this. Curious to hear more about the walkout. Sounds like you won some of your demands from that. Would love some nuts and bolts on how you did it and what your next steps will be. Yeah, thanks for the question, Felix. And uh, thanks, David, hearing about all the work y'all have been doing. It's really great. Um, yeah, I think um, about the walkout, maybe some like nuts and bolts on how we did it, actually to kind of echo what David had mentioned around like um, resolutions. Uh, it also kind of started for us around a shareholder resolution for Amazon to release um, their environmental impact um, because they didn't have any like public data uh, on like what their emissions looked like at all at that time. So that was in 2019. Um, and so that actually was like a really great starting point because I think like a lot of, you know, our coworkers thought like, yeah, like going through this like, um, like the resolution process, like this is kind of like how we can make change in the system. And then just seeing that like, oh wait, like Amazon will always have a majority in this and they can always like be the ones to like strike it down if it doesn't like fit their interest. And so I think that was really agitational for people. Um, and so after that, we also had like an open letter um, to like Jeff Bezos about um, Amazon's like climate impact. Uh, and we got like something like 8, thousand like tech workers signed on to it. And so I think like these like building blocks were really like what led to the walkout. I think for the walkout specifically, it was a, little, a lot of going through like the connections people had made like at the shareholder resolution meeting um, and like people who had signed up on the, signed up for the open letter, like people who maybe worked in the same building as them and doing lots of like one-on-one -on -one, uh, connections, honestly. And like conversations, we kind of did like a, um, we did like a, what's the word, like preceding of the walkout. Um, and I think that's really important because when we announced like our call, like we already had like um, hundreds of people signed up that we like reached out to individually and were like, you know, what is important to you about like this like fight? Like what's your like self-interest for like climate justice and like um, building that when we announced we were able to get like a lot more people signed up because like uh, just seeing like the numbers and feeling more safe for something like like a walkout um, I think was really what built it um, and then some of our demands so for the walkout our demands were like uh, true zero by 2020 or not 2020 sorry that, that happened already um, true zero by 2030 uh, and also uh, investing in uh, communities of color first and so with the climate pledge we did win like a part of that, which was they committed to zero by 2040. And I don't know if you've seen the climate pledge in the news, but they have like other companies signing onto it, which I think is like good, but there's still no justice lens. And 2040 is still like not soon enough, just like based off the science that we know about the climate crisis. Uh, so kind of our next steps is like, we're working on uh, the resolution that I mentioned again around environmental justice now to try and get like, you know, push for Amazon to make commitments about their environmentally racist impact. Uh, so that's kind of like how we got to the walkout, how it's affecting our work now. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Lexi. Um, so uh, for the next question, um, uh, I think uh, either or both of you could take this. Um, it comes from Keith who asks, uh, Keith from UAW 2865, who asks, um, what could it look like to escalate from union resolutions and demonstrations to worker actions that use our power over production to pressure bosses and government into climate action? Well, let's see, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and I think the, the demonstrations thing actually hasn't been played out very much because you don't see a lot of demonstrations of workers on climate issues, do you? Um, I think it would be really interesting if people in their workplaces had um, did, did a rally at a work site, at a job site over a particular climate issue, just like the folks at, at Amazon did, um, you know, if multiple workplaces would make this an issue and do public displays, I think that would be a huge building block 
because you know it's interesting that it, that a um, a major employer um, without a, a representational union would have a walkout because of the activism of these folks, whereas the traditional unions, it's you know, uh, um, I hope folks can bring up some examples, but um, it's a very rare thing to do that on a climate issue. So. Um, I, I would say worker power would start with educating the workforce and, and sort of replicating what the Amazon workers would do. I would, I would call that as a, you know, um, a, a very good basic stepping, stepping stone, a initial point to, to work on. Yeah, I think um, I, I love that. And I think bringing up just kind of like the in place, like, uh, or like in person stuff. I know we've been at least for tech workers, we've been uh, working remotely uh, for the past year. And so it's kind of limited some of our, like, you know, things that we can do uh, that we could do previously. Like other things that we did do leading up to the walkout is that we would like uh, do like our work together in like the lobby of a building and just have a sign up that was like, oh, we're like walking out uh, for climate justice, like ask us questions. Uh, and like, we just got a lot of people like really interested just like, passing through uh, that were like coworkers that we might not have reached. And then people, you know, came up to us and asked questions. So I definitely think, you know, being uh, like seeing what you can do and being, uh, you know, just like trying uh, different things. Uh, yeah. Um, that's uh, super. And we have another question. Um, from Aidan McNally, um, um, who says, thanks to you both and for the great examples, have there been any discussions about incorporating climate demands into bargaining? Um, and I think this question should probably go to you, David. I was trying to remember what was in our bargaining demands from um, our last contract, uh, but one of the things that uh, our union has tried to do is, is, is um, what's called bargaining for the common good, where you ask for things that will benefit um, local communities, um, things that go beyond the workforce. And um, this would certainly be one of those kinds of issues. Um, certainly there's um, a lot of other industries, teachers and nurses are come to mind really quickly as, as um, uh, unions that have the potential and have successfully done bargaining for the common good, you know, for on behalf of students or on behalf of their patients. Um, in the Postal Service, uh, we have tried that. We, we've, um, we have wanted to expand Postal Services to uh, Postal Banking has actually been a big issue that our union has promoted. That, I mean, sort of incidentally, it would provide, uh, it would provide jobs and, and work, work, you know, job security for our workforce, but uh, Postal Banking if you actually look at it, um, would help folks by um, giving them an alternative to predatory lenders, payday lending, and also give banking inex give inexpensive banking services to folks who live in banking deserts in areas where banks have closed their branches, don't find it profitable, that sort of thing. So we we uh, do believe in bargaining for the common good. I don't remember any climate change um, demands in our last contract. Our new contract is coming up in um, our, our negotiations are starting very soon. So I would also be interested in seeing if we have something that's climate change related. Thanks so much, David. Um, Lexi, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to this question or, or not. Uh, I mean, as far as like, have there been discussions? Uh, not too sure, but should there be? Like, I think 100%, we've definitely like, uh, worked with like coworkers in warehouses, like in um, like San Bernardino, for example, and just like hearing stories about like the pollution that they face and like uh, their kids like having asthma or like the park being next to like a major rail yard and stuff like that. Like, I definitely think like these are things people care about and would be really like in their self-interest and really motivated and energized to um, work towards, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I have a question related to the question of worker power, um, which is, um, and um, I think this applies to both of y'all, but especially to the work that Amazon employees for climate justice is doing. Um, since you're working in a, in a non-union context, how is working on um, climate justice 
helped you to build um, an idea of workers working together um, as uh, um, a body of labor action, um, rather than a group, just a group of interested people um, working on an issue that they happen to all be interested in. Um, like what makes climate justice a labor issue for the folks that are involved? And has there been anything in the process of working on it together that has um, led people to become more invested in this? And I think um, also, David, if you wanted to answer this in a union context, I think that also could apply, but I was particularly interested in it from a non-union context. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question that I'll have to think about. Um, but I guess things that that does make me think of um, is that like for, you know, the tech worker space where there like aren't unions right now, um, I think it's just really uh, been like transformative for workers to like engage in like the struggle of organizing, for example, and like where the target is Amazon, right? Like, it's not just like people thinking about like, oh, sustainability in the United States. It's like the impact that like the company that we're working at uh, is making. And so I think that's like the um, kind of important piece because like so many people, especially from our campaign now that we've heard from, like are from places that are already experiencing like climate crisis. Like, um, I mean, for example, like uh, I'm Indonesian, I have family in Bekasi, which is outside of Jakarta and like, there's already like floods like regularly. And like, I don't know if people have heard, but like Indonesia's moving the capital uh, from Jakarta uh, to East Kalimantan, which is like uh, safe from flooding. But like uh, so many people like have stories like that where they see like either family like impacted by like climate change already. Uh, and so I think like engaging people in that struggle and then knowing that Amazon has such a huge impact uh, and that like as workers, like we have the power to move Amazon and to check that like huge power, uh, I think has really like, um, you know, been transformative for people and seeing like the power of like collective action and like worker organizing and stuff like that. Um, yeah, was that, was that interesting? <laughs> Very much so. Um, so yeah, um, just a reminder to everyone that you can submit questions through the Q&A. Um, we do have one more question through that. Um, uh, this is from Eric Meyer, um, who asks about the Climate Union Jobs Act. Um, what unions are, uh, what are unions doing to pass it and save thousands of union jobs and a quarter of Illinois' clean electricity? Um, so I'm not personally familiar with that uh, legislation, but uh, I thought I'd open it up to both of you um, in case you are. Well, I am not familiar with that, le with that legislation. And, um, you know, legislation is a funny thing because um, the Postal Service is affected by a lot of legislation because we're, we're federal employees, right? And our union tries to get people involved in that. It's um, it's interesting because um, it's an interesting question because things are so far away in Washington D.C. and motivating individuals is such an atomized act. You know, call your representative, call your senator, and people do that. I do that, right? But it's um, not quite collective action in the way that maybe builds sort of uh, sort of a sense of solidarity. Um, and um, you know, on the other hand, legislation is really important right now and having had a climate denier president and now having a president who is certainly saying the right things and looking more like a green, more of a green friendly president than we had thought he would be perhaps um, before this election. I think um, that if we're going to get some legislation passed that's pro-union and, and environmentally friendly, we've got kind of a two-year window to work with. Um, and it's, it's important to get that stuff done. So the legislative arena is, is pretty important. Um, it's sort of strange that it's, there's a dichotomy between the legislative arena and the arena of workers' power, right? And even though, you know, both have their own place, their own role to play in this whole dynamic. Thanks, David. Um, 
And we have another question. Um, this is from Adam Schills, who says, David, Britain has postal banking. Uh, my first account was a post office savings account. Um, and Lexi on the walkout, can you please talk about the nuts and bolts? How long was the walkout? How many people participated? What did workers do during the walkout? Thanks, Adam. Should I start for this one? Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, how long was the walkout? Um, I guess, so our walkout was in conjunction, conjunction with the global climate strike, which was like a youth led sort of movement, especially by like Sunrise, uh, for example. Um, and so what we did is that like we met in kind of like the center of our like Amazon campus, like HQ. Um, and then we marched from there to like meet the youth marchers because they were also um, doing like a walkout and strike with like Fridays for the Future. Um, and then we all walked, marched down to like uh, City Hall. So how many people participated? I think it's like somewhere on the magnitude of like 3000. I think in Seattle though, we had like 2000 plus people. Um, and uh, what did workers do during the walkout? So we had like a rally first uh, where we had like uh, people speaking about like their stories and like why this is important. We did some like, you know, chanting. <laughs> uh, we had like signs for people to hold, of course. Um, I think it was really fun just seeing like engineers like do chants and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess how long was the walkout? I think the march was probably a mile from like the uh, spheres in Seattle down to like Seattle City Hall and probably about like halfway along that march we met with like the youth movement at like an intersection and uh, continued marching with them. Um, yeah and then oh and then there was another rally at City Hall. David I don't know if you wanted to comment on postal banking. Postal banking is good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, well, actually, we used to have postal banking um, in this country back, uh, if you uh, recall, in the 1930s, if you know your history during the Depression, the banks failed. People didn't trust the banks. So the post office was a bank. We did have postal banking in the United States. People don't know that. OK. Um, and in 1966, I think during the 60s, the banks, the commercial banks got together and persuaded the um, the government to persuaded Congress to revoke postal banking. So we they took away postal banking because that was, you know, a, a low price competitor. So we we have a history of postal banking and um, that we hope to to bring back. Um, just to comment on the climate strike issue. Um, so I'm a postal worker. It's illegal for me to strike, even though postal workers um, founded our union with the giant, with the largest wildcat strike in American labor history in 1970. Um, people don't know that, but our union was founded on, on an illegal strike. Um, having said that, um, it would be very difficult these days to persuade people to, to strike at the post office, and I wouldn't want to do that. Um, however, there are people who are better placed to do that. Um, and I think it'd be really interesting, uh, particularly in areas like in California, which have been so seriously affected by Wild, wildfires and evacuations summer after summer in those areas, or if you're in a profession, maybe um, teachers can do something like this with their students. If I would really like to see uh, labor unions participate locally in climate strikes, even if it's just only in a symbolic way to say that, you know, labor and working people are part of this uh, concern about, um, about, you know, climate change. It's, it's a very serious issue that's going to affect us all. And I think, um, you know, the, the hard work of educating people as to how important this is could be leading up to this, or it can be uh, sort of assisted by people saying, hey, the unions have a contingent of climate strike. Um, maybe we're not asking you to leave your job, but this is why we're doing it. We're out here, uh, at least symbolically representing you. Of course, you know, obviously be better if you could, um, if you could, if you're in a position to have a walkout and, you know, that would sort of, um, elevate the level of publicity and consciousness raising you could do. Thanks, David. Um, so we have uh, another question. Um, this is from Julia McRae, um, who says, I sometimes think we should be really radical and try to bargain some climate provisions and forego wage raise requests. 
It is an emergency. Also, really aren't raises part of the capitalist system, constant growth. If you would like to reflect on that, I would be interested to hear it. David, would you like to go first? Sure. Yeah, um, raises are part of the capitalist system, but they're, you know, they're an ameliorator. Uh, they're, they're a positive part, at least for our members. Um, so I don't think that um, our members would want to um, want to forego raises. Um, you know, there, there's the, the philosophy of America, as as dictated by our by our uh, capitalist employers, uh, is to consume more stuff. You know, and um, the postal service is part of the transport mechanism for people to consume more stuff. People are ordering a lot of stuff online. It's part of our business, um, and I think. Uh, it's part of our maybe responsibility to try and figure out how to make that that the actual uh, operations of it more environmentally friendly, you know, and go beyond our, our sort of employers' platitudes. Our employers basically interested in nothing but the bottom line. You know, they 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 ordered the, the gasoline power delivery vehicles because it's cheaper. That's it. It's cheaper, right? Um, so we need to be able to push beyond the you know. And it's going to be difficult because business and employers are all about the money, right? Um, so as far as foregoing wage raises um, in, in favor of environmental concerns, you know, it's, it's um, I don't think we have to do that or we should, we should settle for that. You know, we want better, better things for, our, for the workers. We also, better things for workers includes, you know, a better environment for our families. And I think um, the more that, that, um, unions or workers can place these kind of demands in their collective bargaining with their employer, it puts pressure from them on, on that side. And if you publicize, you know, if you're bargaining for the common good, especially in the environment, you'll get a lot of sympathy from, from people in the public who are also aware, you know, and I think it's a very pro-union move to bargain um, against climate change, against your employer, because your employers don't care about climate change. All they care about is the bottom line. Yeah, I love everything uh, David just said. I think especially like a company like Amazon, like they, we can, we should be able to get it all, right? And we should ask them to give us all of it. Um, yeah. Uh, one question I had was, um, have there been any examples from your own industries or outside of them internationally um, that you found particularly inspiring um, have you connected, like David, have you connected with postal workers? Um, in, uh, I know they're in the chat. Um, someone had mentioned the Canadian postal workers or Lexi, have you connected um, with Amazon workers outside the United States working on climate change issues? Well, I, I'd say um, in the past, we have, um, our union locally here in Seattle, we used to meet with the regional uh, Canadian Postal Workers Union and have have joint educational se sessions. We call them solidarity meetings. And that went on for about 10 years and then leadership changed and we stopped doing that. The Canadian Postal Workers Union is a very progressive union. Um, they have um, some very good ideas, including, um, let's see, I, I believe community power is one of them. And I was mentioned in the chat and I, I'm somewhat familiar with that. I've met some of the postal workers at the labor notes conferences. Um, but I, I do think that, um, that there's definitely opportunities for our employers to improve in, in some ways that maybe people have people haven't thought of. Uh, the postal service actually has solar panels on their processing facility in Los Angeles, which they point to as a great example, and they're doing a couple more pilot projects elsewhere. Um, community power um, is an idea. I'm not sure exactly what the shape of it is in Canada, but um, in the United States, uh, there's so many postal buildings that could have solar panels that could create power to, to mitigate local power draws that they do to produce their own power, either, either to, to run electric vehicles out of their own facility or just to um, create power for themselves and for the community. And so um, 
that's an idea that I think can be expanded on because, you know, where does the power come from is really important. If we have electric vehicles, but it's all coal powered electricity, that's not going to be a huge help, right? So the, the process of transforming our, our electric sources is kind of a different question from what we're talking about. But, you know, when you look at the fact that um, our buildings can create electricity through solar power, you know, those things can become connected. Yeah, I think as far as um, our group, we've been really um, focused on like HQ in Seattle and like um, like American workers, uh, especially like we're connected with other like warehouse workers that are organizing and other tech workers who are organizing at other companies. Um, but I definitely think like that is so needed, like international solidarity, because like, like I was talking about with like sacrifice zones in the United States um, and like black and Latinx communities like that is happening worldwide. Um, so yeah, I think the need is definitely there and uh, we could do more on it. And I would add that um, we have a very large immigrant workforce at the Postal Service and a lot of them are in touch with their family back home or visit back home. And so, you know, climate change has had a really big impact in many parts of the world. Um, and to the extent that people see that, you know, while we, we're, we're in a wealthy nation, we're trying to, you know, we have a lot of resilience because we have a lot of resources. But if you look at other countries, you know, where our members have family and these countries aren't doing as, as well or getting hit even worse, um, I think those are folks who are much more open to listening to the seriousness of climate change and why that's an issue for them and their union, as opposed to just some public policy issue they can ignore. Yeah, I think that um, that's a really great point. Like, uh, there's a lot of uh, visa workers in, um, in the Amazon like tech space. And so like, mm -hmm. lots of people have, um, you know, family in other countries. And so like, yeah. So I haven't been really able to follow the chat. You know, I'm sort of following the flow of the discussion, but I'd, I'd be really interested in hearing if some of the folks attending the workshop had something they'd like to share in terms of um, along the lines of our discussion, you know, things that'd be of interest in, in, in the ways they've, been, they've had successes or tried to approach issues. Um, you know, if, if we could uh, hear back from you, that'd be great. Uh, Sharab, I'm also seeing uh, a comment from Charlie in chat. I'd love to talk about it if that's cool. Sure, go, go for it. Yeah, um, I think, uh, so our group definitely didn't invent uh, race-based caucusing. I think this is like a racial equity tool that has been developed by others and like used. And so uh, I think like our group, we've seen success with it. People like self-identify into caucuses. So we're not like, um, necessarily like forcing people to like participate in them. And I think there's also definitely room to grow. I think your point about like people of color being like a really umbrella term, like I totally agree. Um, I mean, I'm Indonesian. I think like a lot of the conversation recently about like around like stop Asian hate, I think isn't like super nuanced because like the Asian Americans is like also a super <laughs> diverse group of people. Um, and so I think like what our group has done, like I think these things aren't like set in stone, I think they can definitely change. Uh, we've done like Jewish and non-Jewish caucusing before um, and seen success with it. Um, and I think the like main thing is just that like uh, not addressing racism is just going to make the issues worse. And so I think we found that race-based caucusing has been really useful and being able to like back the leadership of people of color, um, like to center voices of people who are like more affected um, and also kind of like build uh, relationships and work on our own uh, biases. So I definitely suggest, you know, looking into it, seeing if it's like good for your organization. I think we've seen a lot of success with it. And I think most people who have participated would, it, um, you know, come away with the uh, sort of take 
hear about like segregation. Uh, I think it's been really transformative for everyone's thinking uh, in this space. Thanks, Lexi. Um, that's really helpful. Um, so in response to uh, David's question about uh, folks who have brought stuff up in the chat, um, Julia McRae had said, um, we also tried to bargain transfers between school districts to cut down on commuting. We called it a green lateral transfer. The thought of two, of second, uh, I think it says, oh, two grade four teachers passing each other on the commute every day for 30 years when they could just switch jobs and save all that fuel and prevent all that pollution was interesting to us. Um, the problem was different districts are different employers. Although we bargained provincially, we um, uh, can, uh, we'll try again. Um, and then I'm just chat, going through the chat, looking for any other comments that folks have made on their own situations. Uh, Rebecca Keach had mentioned um, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers has a just transition campaign called Delivering Community Power. Um, David, I believe you discussed this earlier. Um, it's a pretty ama amazing way of reimagining how postal work can drive meaningful climate solutions. Um, and there's a link uh, in the chat um, for folks who are interested in learning more. Um, uh, and then Julia had also said, um, we are doing an ongoing project with our partners and teacher unions in Honduras. They're designing curricula to uh, help kids understand why so many people are emigrating, climate change that's devastating the economy, et cetera, so that kids can have a clear analysis of what is happening to them. They are then more informed politically. Um, this is development of curriculum materials that address climate change in a really interesting way. We are proud to support that work in solidarity. Um, and then finally, we have a comment from Felix um, who said, I was pretty interested in what you were talking about, David, regarding strengths and weaknesses of using resolutions in our locals. Uh, petitions and surveys seem like a way to push elected union leadership to have a conversation about the topic even more than a resolution, but also hard to know where to escalate from after a petition or a resolution actually if you want to shift real policy in your union. Um, so I don't know if David or Lexi, you want to respond to any of those or all of them. Yeah, I think that's a great, great comment by Felix. Um, and people in different workplaces in different situations, um, you have to kind of get a feel for how things work. Uh, petitions are a great idea. Surveys are a great idea. Um, you know, you can use those to push your union leadership or the union leadership can use that to raise a conversation, you know, depending on where you are situated in the union. Um, and yes, resolutions can be great or resolutions can be totally meaningless. Like the labor councils pass lots of great resolutions. How many get implemented? You know, what kind of muscle do you put behind them? I mean, do you do anything about them? That's, um, is there an actionable component? So um, that's very important. So assessing, your, assessing where you are um, is good. and. Yes, we'd like to see lots of unions pass resolutions on against climate change, but recognizing that even though it might even be difficult to do that where you are, right? But having done that, what have you done, right? You've gone on record. Um, you've got to keep going after that. It's it's just a step, right? It's not actually accomplishing anything until you you know do something concrete with it, which is po certainly possible and it's certainly a good first step. But it's it's a very good comment that that that. Um, it's just one tactic you can use along with petitions, along with surveys, depending on, you know, where you're situated and what your workplace is about. But they're all good for getting discussion started. If you can get as many people part of that process, you're exposing the issue, you make them think about it, you make them talk, make, you make them talk about it. You actually may not win the first time you bring an issue up, but I've seen in my union many times, resolutions come up, people aren't used to the idea, they don't pass it the first time. Uh, the next convention, it becomes accepted. It passes with very little debate because people have, you know, have come to understand the point you're trying to make to them. So a, a good comment about that. And I also like um, the comment about the um, the teachers and the different school districts because we have similar, you know, it's sort of bureaucratic reasons why um, two postal employees can't like transfer here and there. And um, what I like about it, you get you get um, very few issues where it's a win-win-win all around if you can change it. 
it, it helps the employer, it helps the employees, it's good for the environment. How many of those are there? It should be easy, right? Except it's not because we have these, we have districts, we have barn units, we have installations, we have all these structures. Um, and so um, it takes some pushing, but the fact that directly it affects the members, um, you know, people drive incredible amounts of time, of, of distance for good union jobs, right? And especially the way our, our, our cities are, they're more expensive. Seattle's very expensive. People drive an hour and a half to get to a postal job or union job. Pardon the dogs in the background. Um, maybe I'll stop. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks to the dog as well. Um, uh, Lexi, did you want to add anything? Uh, I think just to echo what David was saying, I think like from the resolution, that's like the start of the work, you know, it's like, then it's like really building and like talking to coworkers. Um, and like, that's, uh, that's where the power comes in, I feel. Um, so yeah, just like the value of like relational organizing and just like talking to people one on one, especially in like the tech space, like people are really siloed and don't really have too much communication with each other. So like building those relationships has been really like important. And I think to like our success. So. Um, so it looks like we have another question. Um, this is from Noreen Buckley, who says, any thoughts of climate change affecting the building trades or how it is an opportunity for minorities, particularly women's entrance into union jobs? Um, and I can actually comment on this a little bit um, because I uh, cover climate change for labor notes and um, one of the things that's been really hopeful in the last few weeks even um, are the number of uh, folks, whether it's building trades, people who have expressed an, op uh, an openness to offshore wind projects and those projects kind of being a little bit more open to project labor agreements that um, are uh, guaranteeing or encouraging union jobs, union benefits, union wages. Um, or, um, uh, or the, although they're not a building trade, the, um, the mine workers um, recently um, expressed an openness to um, uh, climate change infrastructure uh, projects uh, from the federal government. And so um, I think we're seeing the uh, uh, beginning of a real shift coming um, from some of the last holdouts in the um, labor movement on the issue of uh, climate change. I don't wanna overstate it because um, obviously there's a lot of work to be done um, and a lot of people's um, livelihoods and jobs are at stake. Um, and that's something that's important to keep in mind um, even as we try to address the climate change issue. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, but um, I just wanted to, uh, uh, point to that. And um, I don't know if uh, David or Lexi wanted to comment further on that question or on the question of um, how climate change um, provides an entrance point for women um, or other um, disempowered groups to enter into union jobs. Well, I, I think the whole concept of having a just transition, you know, um, from one set of workplace technologies or ways of operating uh, to a more uh, more uh, environmentally friendly one, um, but then having it not harm either workers or um, workers who are in particularly disadvantaged situations because of their gender, their immigration status, their race, or the communities that, they, that are affected by your services. Um, I think the concept of just transition is very important because um, the environmental movement for a long time has um, has functioned, I guess, from early on. It was seen as sort of a province of sort of uh, white middle class liberal sort of um, privilege and not taking other communities into account. Um, hopefully, we've moved to a place where people recognize that and that you know um, that the effects on workers and communities of color and people in the job market are are all um, carefully considered when we're taking environmental action. And so uh, we're in time of crisis and crisis is, um, you know, crisis can be used by the, by the, the big employers to 
change things in their direction, but a crisis can also be an opportunity, you know, for us to push in the other direction. We're in a time of change. And so um, I think we're in a very good time to make our concerns heard on these issues. You know, the, the, the concept is a great one. So um, I think um, we have a lot of hopeful, hopeful things to look forward to in all this discussion. Uh, so one um, topic that's come up in the chat that's really interesting um, coming off of the discussion of resolutions um, is uh, Julia McRae suggested that you could pass a resolution that funds a position in the union um, for a climate change action advocate or um, the establishment of committees with paid time to address the issue. And then um, Linda Ray had suggested um, that SEIU here in um, Northern California as a Climate Justice Committee, though it doesn't have release time for members, but it does have some staff time support. And that both the Alameda and San Francisco Labor Councils have climate justice committees and have participated as labor contingents in marches uh, in 2019. Um, so that's um, some additional stuff that came from the discussion on resolutions. I think a climate uh, climate change committee is a great idea, you know, because you're, you're getting um, I mean, you've got a group of people with a purpose and it's one purpose, right? And you can bring people in who wanna work on this. Um, having a paid position can cut both ways because you know, I just see the way that um, unions operate. If somebody can run for office and get a paid position, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a full-time postal worker and a part-time union officer. So maybe I'm just a little, have a particular viewpoint on this thing but I would rather see a committee of people rather than one person because it's so easy to say, that's that one person's job rather than you know, all of us. But you know, it, it would be interesting, interesting to see how that worked in practice. Somebody who is really uh, in passion, you know, passionate about that could do a great job in a position like that. Um, and Linda had wanted us to note that the SCIU local she was referring to is SCIU 1021. Um, and Julia also added that the Eco Justice Committee, where she is, has produced many posters for classrooms and lots of teachers post them, and it creates a brand for the union as well, which is a really interesting idea. Um, so we are nearing the end of our program for the day. Um, uh, so I just want to um, put a final call for any questions that anyone has. You can put them in the chat, you can put them in the Q&A, um, see uh, anything that you have to say. Um, and uh, while you're doing that, I'll give uh, David and Lexi uh, a few minutes um, to say anything else that they want to say at the close of the discussion. Um, and we'll go from there. You wanna go first, Lexi? Please. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, this pandemic has kind of disrupted everything and the front page of news is all about the pandemic and climate change has kind of taken a back seat but um, you know, it's, it's gonna keep, unfortunately, uh, it's gonna be back on the front pages pretty soon. Um, you know, I'm going down to help my sister in California clear out where she lives because she's thinking of moving just because she's been evacuated so many times because of the forest fires. In Oregon nearby, we had, you know, a whole town wiped out by forest fires last year. And you know, my kind of uh, morbid joke around here is we used to have four seasons and now we have five, we have fire season, which is literally true. And all these N95 masks that you know are so useful during the pandemic, we're going to be wearing them because it's summertime and we've got fires from March to October. Um, so it's it's an issue that people are trying to deny. And people who live in you know people in my own union on Facebook groups, we see the discussion right there. But it's going to get harder and harder to deny. And um, you know it's it may seem like it's difficult to get 
um, this issue um, some serious attention in your union or in your local or you know you're in your arena but um, the the impetus for it for it is there and uh, I think more people will listen to you now having seen what's going on in, in just in, locally than your leadership might actually estimate right that people will really respond if you're if you're trying to draw these connections you know this is a really important time to be doing this kind of work Yeah, I totally uh, echo what David said. I think like a lot of things that people have brought up in chat have been really uh, interesting. And so it's giving me a lot to think about um, coming out of this. And I think just like um, workers having the power to press to pressure like these corporations to move on climate change and like knowing that like uh, workers who are already being affected by this like are way closer to the solutions. Um, and so like listening to those workers is so important. Like for example, Amazon's like electrifying some of their delivery fleet. But um, as we've heard from our like coworkers and warehouses, like the majority of the pollution is from diesel trucks. And so like if Amazon doesn't actually um, change that, then like we're not really seeing that like, you know, as big of a movement as like Amazon wants to like sell us in their PR. Um, and so uh, I just encourage everyone to, you know, talk about climate justice. I think it's been really energizing to talk to coworkers, talk about environmental racism. People have so many stories um, of like family and friends who like are there and living it already. And like, we've seen it be really transformative to, um, you know, engage people uh, on like sort of self-interest issues based organizing and really bring them into the labor movement in like a way that I think maybe they didn't have that touchstone before. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks both of you. Um, I think it's been a really great conversation today and um, uh, it's very much thanks to both of you. Um, we've had on um, David Yao, who's the vice president of the Seattle local from APWU and Lexi from Amazon Employees for Climate Justice. Um, uh, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, please stay tuned for other events in Labor Notes April month of troublemaking. Um, we still have a few more to go before the end of the month. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing you there. Um, uh, please stay tuned for climate related news and other labor news um, and union news on Labor Notes. That's at labornotes.org and have a wonderful rest of the weekend to everyone. I um, hope you have a, a great day. Thanks so much for joining us.